Hi everybody, my name is Hannah. Welcome to my channel. So today I thought I would do a kind of a summer reading roundup type thing. I was going to do a July reading wrap up. But then I was out of town and I realized that by the time that I would get around to filming it, it would be like mid-August. Um, and I was like, why don't I do an August wrap-up? And then I realized that I also have a few books that I read at the tail end of June that I wouldn't mind including in the year. So I just figured, why not do a summer wrap-up? I know technically summer goes until September 21st, but we're just going to pretend that September is like fall from the beginning, you know, because that's how my mind works. Um, so... I'm just gonna go through all the books I read from like end of June-ish all the way until like yesterday basically and uh, let you know what my thoughts about them are. For some of them I will have uh, more detailed reviews but for the most part I think I will just have my thoughts in here. So the first book that I want to talk about is The Unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren um, and I'm not really gonna review this book because I feel like I don't read enough romance to give a proper review. But what I will tell you about is my reading experience of this book, and um, I'll say that I read this book right at the height of the protests in June, um, and I was kind of following along with everything that was going on, and I was very distressed and very preoccupied with all of that, and I couldn't like I couldn't look away, and I just got to a point where I was actually getting a headache, so I needed to do something different and. I don't know why but I was like I'm gonna pick up this and read it and I did and it was kind of like a godsend because it was um, just the right kind of light and breezy read that I needed to um, you know get me through those um, couple of days uh, of course you know things are still happening and the situation hasn't really improved much um, but I, I will just say that for me in that moment in, in time it was a, a much needed reprieve and um, I really really liked it because of that so I feel like I can't really um, articulate some like constructive thoughts about it what I will say is that I really liked the way the book uh, played with the idea of like what how what does it take for you to form an initial impression of someone and how can you be 100% wrong or like you know how are you perceived like by the people and I liked how how that happened with multiple characters in the book like the two main characters but also some other ones as well so that was kind of fun and yeah it was a hate to love romance so that was also a lot of fun um, and the bickering and the banter and the ooh there's only one bad whole thing and it's just kind of you know it was fun it was fun I had fun reading it and I kind of really needed something that um, just made me kind of go away for a bit and that was exactly what this was the next book that I read after that is a nonfiction title, and it is Hood Feminism, Notes from the, the Women That a Movement Forgot by Mickey Kendall. I have followed Mickey Kendall for a while on Twitter. Uh, I know she's written other books before, um, and I think she also, I don't know whether she writes comics and SFF stuff, but she is involved in that world somehow. But this book is basically about um, the various topics um, that feminism likes to pretend doesn't involve it, like it's so things like gun violence, um, housing scarcity, uh, food scarcity, all of those things, um, and how they're actually essential in order to make feminism as inclusive as possible and live up to its actual purpose. You know, you need to kind of think about all those different things because um, these are the issues that affect most women, um, most women who aren't basically white cishat women. Um, and so Mickey Kendall does a great job of like delving into each of these topics and um, kind of deconstructing how our understanding of feminism, I use our in a very loose way, but basically the like accepted understanding of feminism often ignores the ways that these issues, these other societal issues make it hard for women of color in particular. She talks a lot about black women specifically, she is a black woman, um, and how all of these things that we don't like to talk about in feminist circles are actually a big barrier for women of color, black women, indigenous women, and in, in participating in the feminist uh, discourse and movements. And so if, if we really want to think about feminism as a movement for all women, then we have to think about how these issues 
um, intersect with issues of gender inequality and often um, they like their comorbid issues and so it's like you know you've got more than one thing that's kind of like holding you back and so without thinking about these things you really aren't servicing all women anyways um, it was I think I can't remember how many essays there were but there was I think 10 or so essays and each of them was very um, some of them borrowed from her life others from her research um, and it was very North American focused but there were a few references to other countries as well um, but yeah so I really really enjoyed that book I think I gave it a five out of five stars um, on Goodreads because I, I found that it was I don't think I learned too too much that was new although there were a few chapters particularly about um, housing scarcity and food uh, food scarcity in the US that I thought that I learned some new things um, and I'm sure these issues that she talks about that are US specific are also probably applicable elsewhere um, but I just thought that it did a good job of like demonstrating why our understanding of feminism and specifically white feminism doesn't really um, serve all women and so I, I gave it five stars because I thought it did a good job of you know exploring the topic that it said it was going to explore the next book that I read is Freedom is a Constant Struggle by Angela Davis um, and this is a collection of interviews um, and speeches and I think a few essays that Angela Davis has given over the past like 10 years or so. Uh, it was published in 2016 I believe um, and it kind of talks about a lot of the ideas that Angela Davis is, is known for exploring so things like prison abolition um, Ugh. how the different struggles across the world are very much interconnected um, in fact I think the subtitle is Ferguson Palestine and the foundation of a movement so it kind of talks about all of the different um, ways that people across the world are basically fighting a similar if not the same battle in different places um, I thought it was a good way to get introduced kind of to Angela Davis's ideas and thoughts and um, the the things that she has talked about in more detail in other books I haven't read any of her other books but I do really want to pick up uh, some of her other works that delve into some of these topics in more detail I do think the other works are a bit more academic than this one um, and I will say I listened to this on audio and so it felt very conversational and easy to kind of follow through but I can see why it might be a bit tricky to follow through if you're reading it because it's like like it's like some of them are transcriptions of speeches that she's given at like universities and things like that and so I can see how it's hard to focus and, and follow along with those and it was a little bit repetitive at times I personally didn't mind it mostly because one I'd been wanting to read this for a very long time and my library I had just gotten it even though I'd requested it for like ages um, and two I I found that even though it was repetitive the the repetitive nature of it kind of like hammered down uh, all the different ways in which um, Angela Davis likes to explore these different topics so I, I found that even though sometimes it was repetitive you were kind of seeing a different angle of the same issue every time like she spoke at someone and I also found her um, her ability to kind of focus the um, the ideas that she talks about to the audience that she's speaking to so she has a, a speech in Turkey I think and one in the UK and one in Ferguson and every time she talks to all of these crowds she makes the speech very much about those people and that particular group and I really I really love the way that she kind of although it was repetitive how the ideas are applicable to all of these different groups um, so yeah I think I gave that one also five stars um, again part of it is that I was like you know what I, I needed a primer on Angela Davis and that's what I wanted and what, what this was for me and I you know I have no complaints the next book I read is Queen of the Conquered by Case and Calendar I did a whole review on this so I'm not going to talk about it too much uh, basically what it comes down to is I thought this book was a really really interesting concept and I loved what Case and Calendar was doing with the idea of like you know just because you are one of the oppressed doesn't mean you are not complicit in some and sometimes perpetuating um, oppression and also how in these systems it's not enough to play within the system you have to kind of break things down um, anyways this was a novel an adult fantasy novel 
Um, I loved the concept, I did not love the execution, and I talk about it in a lot more detail in the review, which I will link below, so please go check that out. I think I gave that one a 3.5 stars, because the, like, I really loved the concept, but just the execution was was it for me. I really, really struggled with it, and I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get, get on with the way that the book was written and unfortunately that took off the one and a half stars for me um, so yeah the next book that I read is Ain't I a Woman Black Women and Feminism by Bell Hooks this was another one of those books that I had been requesting the audiobook from my library for ages and after the uh, you know this in most recent round of protests and calls for people to become anti-racist in June my library like bought all the audiobooks which I'm very grateful for, I'm not complaining, but it was kind of funny to see how it happened, like the timing of when those books became available. Anyways, I'm not gonna get into that because Lord knows libraries have a lot that they have to, you know, go through and, and struggle with. Um, anyways, Ain't I a Woman was another one of those books that I kind of read to get, a, to get um, a primer on Bell Hooks and her writing. Um, I this was the first book that I've read from her and I really really enjoyed it I I thought it was you know is I thought it was very very relevant despite it being written like 40 years ago so there were so much of it is still extremely relevant today um, and it kind of explores a lot of the same ideas that uh, Mickey Kendall talked about in hood feminism but specifically about black women um, and in this book it's a lot more um, pointed and direct about the ways that white feminism does not serve and in fact often hurts black women. Um, and again, given the time period and probably the fact that this was probably one of the first books around this issue, I do understand why it was like a lot more like, this is the point, you are the problem. Um, and I really appreciated that. I like ended up like tabbing so many quotes and, and things from it. I'll leave a, a link to the Twitter thread that I did uh, which I do that often when I'm reading a book and I'm like really really into it and I'm finding a lot of quotable parts I will tweet thread either my thoughts or the quotes that I really enjoyed so I'll leave, I'll leave that down below um, for this one I think I gave it on Goodreads 5 stars but I would say that it was probably more of a 4.5 because I just you know levels of enjoyment for me I think I, uh, I really liked um, I really appreciated what I learned from it and, and the way that Bell Hooks kind of presented her ideas and um, broke down the ways in which feminism doesn't serve black women, at least from that period and still to a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways to this day. Um, but it just, for me, didn't hit quite as, as, as much as the other books. And I think that's why I gave it on Goodreads five stars because I figured, you know, that was just a personal thing. Um, and also I think it might have had to do with the narration a little bit because I didn't really love the narrator, but... Anyways, um, I'm going to be doing, I think, a video um, at some point in the near future about what I like to call my anti-oppression curriculum. Um, and it's like books that I've read, books that I want to read, and books that I think everyone should read if you kind of want to um, get into anti-oppression, anti-racism, and, and all of those ideas. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll talk about this book and others in more detail in that video, I think. The next book I read is Wash's Praise by Noor Naga. This is a teeny tiny novel, novella, written in verse. Um, and it is about this, I think I talked about it in a recent video, I can't remember which one. But it's basically about this uh, young Muslim woman who um, kind of gets into a romantic relationship with a much older Muslim man. Um, and it's about her kind of going through that. It's very, very much... Um, an internal kind of book because um, you're very much in um, Cuckoo's head and just kind of experiencing this very tumultuous relationship with her and it's a lot about you know the relationship but also about how she thinks about herself in this relationship and in terms of you know um, having this real connection with someone that is um, on paper and by a lot of standards of the day um, is, is, a, is kind of like an, um, a relationship that she should not be having and that is very much looked down upon um, but you know it kind of it's like just about her dealing with that 
as well as her faith and what it means and, and all of that. It's really hard to talk about. Um, I'm not quite sure how to, I don't know, review it. And I'm not sure that I can review it. I, I find this happens to me often with poetry because I feel like it's so subjective. Like what I find, you know, good writing but not that emotionally relevant to me could be something like extremely profound and emotional to someone else. So I definitely experienced that with this. Some of the pieces I found much more hard-hitting than others. Um, and I thought what she was doing with language and the ways in which she was kind of demonstrating this character's um, mental decline and then like ascension, um, really interesting. I think I mentioned this in my last video where I talked about this, but while I do not work on this book, I do know the um, editor who does who, I, who, did, who edited this so just putting that out there for you um, so you're aware but yeah I don't think I rated this one let me just check um, yeah I did not so I'm just gonna leave it I'm like I'm very much like it's hard to talk about I just find poetry so hard to talk about but anyways here it is the next book that I read in August I believe or end of July towards uh, early August is one that I already talked about on history on this channel which is Alexander Hamon's like memoir slash um, nonfiction book about his parents and himself which was called my parents an introduction slash this does not belong to you and this is basically a memoir of Alexander Hamon um, Hamon's parents and their lives in Bosnia and the former Yugoslavia um, and all the ways in which um, their lives changed after the fall of the former Yugoslavia and the Bosnian War um, and it's more about also their understanding of home and culture and what that looks like for him as someone who grew up in that area but also moved um, quite a while ago to North America and you know what 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 that kind of immigration does to a family and to a person's understanding of their home and homeland and all of that. I really, really love this book. I, I think that it's it's really hard for me not to, it's, it's very easy for me to relate to books that talk about how um, being an immigrant impacts your idea of, of home and what home is. And so I was definitely like drawn to this book from the beginning because of that, but also just the way that Alexander Hamon would talk about his parents and, and the way that his parents saw the world um, was just, I had all the feels because I could relate to them personally, but also it kind of gave me a glimpse into what, you know, my parents might be thinking about um, when it comes to the idea of home and, and homeland and all of that. Um, and I'm sure it's, it's different for everyone, culture to culture, and, and depending on the circumstances of you immigrating to somewhere else, um, it's, you know, my parents didn't immigrate to Canada because of war, uh, whereas Alexander Hamon's parents had to run away from their country to Canada because of a war. And so, um, but despite that, I really do think that there is a lot in, in this book that um, if you're a child of immigrants or if you're an immigrant yourself, that you could relate to. Um, as I mentioned, I think in my um, Friday Reads a few weeks ago, the second part of the book, This Does Not Belong to You, I didn't quite connect with as much because it was vignettes from Alexander Hamon's childhood um, up until his adolescence, I think. But I still found it, you know, um, quite well written. He is, he's an, an amazing writer. Like, that's one thing that I have to absolutely give to him is like he's, he has such a way with words that just kind of enchants you. And so that part of it was really amazing. And he has like really great imagery. So I enjoyed that. Um, but I do think the second part of the book kind of brought it down for me to a 4 or 4.5 out of 5 stars. Um, but yeah. So the next book that I read is Superior, The Return of Race Science by Angela Saini. Um, I, I know what you're thinking, Hannah. Do you only read nonfiction about race and, and that kind of thing? And I will say I do read quite a bit of nonfiction um, about race, feminism, social studies type of things. Um, I read a lot of it for a very long time, I would say since like 2015. That's when I kind of started reading a lot more books, um, nonfiction books around these kinds of topics. 
um, which is where the whole anti um, anti oppression curriculum thing comes through because in 2014 when I graduated I realized that that's where my knowledge gaps were and I was like oh god I need to learn more um, but just prefacing this to say that I don't usually read this many in a row but because my library suddenly made a bunch of those books um, always available um, on audio I kind of just was like yes I want to read all of it because I've been waiting to read all of it for a while and you know hadn't had a chance with this one though actually I did get a chance to read it like I think a few months ago um, but I couldn't get to it in time before my hold or not hold my like the lending period expired and I had to return it um, and so Anyways, I don't know why I'm rambling about this, you don't care, <laughs> but Superior, The Return of Race Science, I picked this up on a whim and ended up re-listening to it while I was doing a puzzle and it was kind of like it's, it's I don't know why I'm telling you this, but it was just interesting because I can vividly remember, you know, doing the puzzle and listening to this and kind of like having a lot of feelings and emotions about the stuff that um, is in the book while I was doing the puzzle and while I was having a lot of feelings and emotions about the puzzle. Um, but basically, what this book is, is as the subtitle suggests, it is kind of an exploration of the ways that race science is kind of making a resurgence. Um, this book was published, I think, in 2019 or 2018. Um, and honestly, it is absolutely 100% um, relevant. Um, and it kind of gives you first a history of race science. So kind of how race science began and the ways in which um, a lot of European scientists kind of used um, the funds that were available to them by all the colonial powers um, and, and the ways that the colonial powers kind of made those funds available so that the scientists can prove to everyone that um, there's a, a racial hierarchy in terms of like who's a better human and who isn't and all of those things and so it was an interesting look at that history, but also it kind of, you know, traces the fact that a lot of the same people who were quite prominent in, you know, um, not quite the beginning because this started like centuries ago, but studied under each other are still the people who are kind of perpetuating and, and studying this kind of thing and how they have like journals and they now with the internet have even easier ways of connecting and talking to each other and, and just be, being very much an organized group of people who are actively searching for ways to prove that there are um, very tangible biological factors to um, why, for example, let's just use this one example, why some black students in the U.S. don't do as well in their SATs and testing scores as white students. And it kind of goes into all the ways in which these scientists will like kind of have like a blind eye or like willfully ignore societal aspects that contribute to that. Um, and and some of them will be like, well, yes, the society is a factor in this, but also who's to say that in the future we won't discover that there's a gene. So there's a lot of these scientists operating under the assumption that just because there is no biological proof right now to the fact um, to race science and to like, you know, race, this race is better than this race because of bi biology. Um, while they don't have that data now, a lot of them are like convinced that that data is going to be available at some point in the future. And so it's like the opposite way of thinking about science than what you learn in school usually, which is like, you know, unless you can prove it, then you like it's you can't say that it's real. Um, but these scientists are like, no, no, it's just that we don't have the necessary equipment or the necessary data to prove it, but it doesn't mean that it's not real. And I'm like, what? Um, anyway, so it was just both an infuriating, infuriating and insightful read, and I highly recommend it to anybody who kind of wants to get a look into how these kinds of practices and theories and um, ideas are perpetuated in the systems that exist today and um, some of the systems have been changed especially after World War II and the ways in which race science played a huge role in that and, and uh, benefited greatly from the, um, the events of World War II and the concentration camps and the ways that scientists would like use the prisoners in those camps for their scientific experiments 
Um, so some things did change, but in a lot of ways, a lot of the methods and institutions and systems in place that were used to make those kinds of horrific events possible are still in place today. They're just mi like labeled differently or like, you know, there's an understanding that you don't really do this or that's like, you know, so it's covered with a lot of like jargon, but in a lot of ways that these systems still exist today. And we need to be very careful about the ways in which we um, think about science and scientific experiments and scientific knowledge um, and how we tend to kind of like think that science is above um, things like, you know, racism and all of that, but actually it's very much influenced by it. And, you know, science is being done by humans and humans are very much susceptible to all of these societal issues and all of these systemic issues. And so we can't put it on a pedestal. Um, anyways, I really, really enjoyed this book. Highly recommend it if you're looking for a great kind of overview about race science and how it began and how we, how it operates now. Um, I think Angela Saini also have a, has another book called Inferior, and that one is about um, how women were kind of assigned as the weaker sex. Um, and I'm looking forward to reading that one as well. I don't think I'm going to read it anytime soon, but who knows. Um, but yeah. So after that, you'd think that I would pick up something a bit lighter, but no. Um, I had a hold um, for this next book that I'm going to talk about and so when it came in I was just like okay fine this is not any lighter but I had a hold for a few weeks and I'm not going to let it pass me by um, and it is Jason Reynolds' A Long Way Down which is a middle grade uh, novel in verse about this young boy who just the day before witnesses um, his brother's murder um, he, his brother is shot to death in front of him and he decides that he's going to follow the rules and get revenge on his brother and these rules that he talks about are there's three rules so there's don't cry um, I can't think of I can't remember the second rule but the third rule is like you have to get revenge when when someone you know and love um, is murdered you have to avenge them and so he decides that that's what he's going to do and he gets on an elevator and um, as the elevator starts moving people from his past who have died suddenly start appearing to him and, and having conversations with him and it's kind of this exploration of what the um, issue of gun violence um, and just violence in general and societal issues in um, these communities of mostly black communities in the US how they um, you know lead into the school to prison pipeline and all of these issues and how these understandings of the rules of, of living in those areas um, end up putting a lot of young people in very very terrible situations and in some, in some cases they're dead other cases they end up you know committing crimes that they sh you know wouldn't have done it if, if they'd had more information and things like that and it's just a very heartfelt um, look at that and, and told in a way that it was really it was hard and it was rough but it wasn't um, I don't want to say it was light because that's not the word but it just it wasn't so heavy that it completely shattered you um, I think because it's written for a middle grade maybe younger young adult audience um, and I think the the character is 15 the main character is 15 or, or 14 um, and so it's kind of written with that audience in mind and I really really enjoyed it Jason Reynolds is someone who I've been meaning to pick up his books for a very long time and um, how I've heard a lot about him and people love his work and you know I completely understand why now having listened to this um, audiobook so often I think sometimes books are like written um, they're written about a certain demographic but not necessarily speaking to that demographic and I, I always appreciate when an author can manage to toe that line really really well. So the next book that I read is Queen Bee, a celebration of the power and creativity of Beyonce Knowles Carter, edited by Veronica Chambers. This is a collection of essays from various artists and writers and cultural critics and such 
about Beyonce and what she means to each of these writers and the place that she occupies in culture and all of that. Um, and it was the much re <laughs> after the series of books that I read, it was a much needed kind of like, I don't know, reprieve a little bit because it was, you know, it wasn't like a light read, but it was more, um, there was less at stake, I guess, is, is what I, what I'm kind of getting at. Um, and I really, really enjoyed it. It was, um, obviously being a collection of story, a collection of essays about Beyonce, um, and celebrating Beyonce, most of the essays were from fans and people who really, really love Beyonce, but there were a few that were more critical. I, I would not say that I am a, a diehard Beyonce fan, but I do very much enjoy her music and think she's doing something quite, you know, interesting in the world. Um, so I did enjoy most of this collection. I think at, po at points it got a little bit repetitive because it was like people kind of saying the same thing about, you know, how much they love her. And obviously that's the point of this. It's this, it's in the title. It's like a celebration of Beyonce. Um, but my most favorite essays were the ones that kind of um, got a, like very specific about the topic that they're talking about or like that were... Uh, more nuanced in their understanding of Beyonce. So I think there was one that was called The Elevator, which is about the infamous um, elevator scene of, um, God, I'm blanking on her, Solange. Solange um, kind of fighting with Jay-Z and Beyonce kind of on the side. Um, so this essay was from um, a writer who was like, you know, if you've ever had like, uh, a sister who always looked out for you. You kind of knew exactly what was happening in that scene. Um, and it was really interesting to kind of see her interpretation of that scene. And then there was another essay that was, um, what was it called? Let me just look it up actually. Okay, so the essay was called Getting, Giving, and Leaving. And it was a conversation between this university professor, uh, Melissa Harris Perry, and her student, Mangapur Conte. Um, and so the professor is like a diehard Beyonce fan and the student starts out being more critical. And so it's a conversation in essays almost, although not quite a conversation. So like it's, it functions as a conversation, but I don't think it was intended as such. So it's like how they understood Beyonce in different ages of their lives. So, you know, um, and, and what the different periods of Beyonce's life meant to each of them in that period of their life and so I really appreciated that essay because it kind of like showed a very nuanced understanding of how you can relate to celebrity and celebrity culture and that kind of thing. Um, I found myself more on the monk for um, side of things where I was like you know Beyonce is great but also <laughs> let's let's think about all these other things. I also really liked the essay um, that was the king of pop and the queen of everything by Michael Eric Dyson and it was kind of um, a comparison between Beyonce and Michael Jackson and Prince thrown in there as well um, and the ways in which they've led similar trajectories but also Beyonce is kind of now at a different place than either of those people largely because they have passed away but also there's other differences and I thought that Essie did a really great job of like kind of you know drawing those comparisons and contrasting these artists um yeah so there was a lot more um in the collection i listened to it on audio i think it was like five hours long so not very long um and i really enjoyed it um i, um, I like i said i did i did wish there was more nuanced takes in the essays but again i knew what i was getting into when i picked this up so it, i wasn't that surprised that it was mostly adoration um but yeah if you're if you're a beyonce fan and you kind of want to read something that kind of studies her and what she does and, and, and her place in pop culture, I highly recommend this essay collection. And the very last book that I read this summer is Fury Born by Clara Legrand. So I'm going to do a full review about this, but I will say here that I, I really enjoyed it. It's a huge book for me personally, like it's, it's not, it's like 500 pages and a bit or just under 500 pages. Um, I did think that there were parts that like dragged a little bit and I, some parts that just kind of were like a little bit filler for me personally, but 
I think it's a great setup for what I hope is an amazing series exploring um, two women who are blessed or cursed, however you want to look at it, with in, in an immense amount of power and the ways in which their like respective societies tries to impose rules, expectations, um, I don't know, just all assumptions on them and, and, and how they should or can use this power. And at various points, these two women kind of like rebel against those societies or conform to them or, or you know, anyways, basically two women, very powerful and how everyone else reacts to their very powerful powerfulness. Um, I will get into more detail in my review. I will like what I'll say right now is I really, really enjoyed it and I highly recommend it if you're looking for an interesting YA fantasy um, that's doing some interesting like feministy type stuff with its female characters. Um, didn't love the romances in this um, or not that I didn't love them. I just wasn't interested. Um, so if that's what you're looking into, <laughs> you're looking for in your YA fantasy, I don't know that I would recommend this one, um, but I would recommend it for basically everything else. Look forward to my review where I get into more details about everything. Um, but yeah, so that is my summer wrap up. Um, how many books was that? Like 10, 12? Uh, I don't know. Around that um, place. Um, and yeah, I'm in the middle of like five other books which is the norm with me because that is who I am. Um, I read like 500 books at the same time. Um, but I'm not, I don't think I'll finish them in, in time for them to be summer reads, even if I do finish them by September 21st. Um, it's like September 1st, it becomes fall. I don't care. I know that I argue the other way around with June. I'm like, it's not June 21st, it's not summer yet. But when it comes to fall, I'm like, I'm ready for it to be here. And so I don't care what the date says or what the sun says. Like, Anyways, um, let me know if you've read any of these books um, and what you thought of them. If you agreed with me, if you disagreed with me, if you think I, you have recommendations for me. Um, and what did you read this summer? What's your favorite book from the past like month or two months, I guess? Um, but yeah, I'm going to go now because I've been rambling for so long. And I will see you in my next video.